on to our next speaker. He seems to be making it a habit to speak at Rex and pulls a coup on us all the time and comes and mesmerizes people with his astounding thoughts. We have Kaisar Kotwal. Kaisar was a fellow last year and he has been chosen for the Dr. Varghis Korean One Vision to Make a Difference in Our World Karmavir Puraskar this year. Kaisar announced the One Billion Rising campaign last year at Rex. And for the past two years, the One Billion Rising campaign has gone from strength to strength and has gained huge momentum across the globe. He does this with his other volunteers and people who work with him. Kaisar promotes the Vagina Monologues uh, in, in India. He's the producer for the play. He's also an Emmy Award winner. And Kaisar is basically going to speak on connecting the dots, enabling a violence-free world for women and children. Kaisar Kotwa. I'll be here for a bit and then, yes, yes. And I'll, I'll try and move about. Um, coming here is always a sort of an exercise in humility um, to see uh, the absolutely amazing work that everybody's doing. Um, I'm an accidental activist. I didn't sort of plan one day to um, <clears throat> grow up and be that. And certainly, I never thought that it would be in the field of um, violence against women and children. It happened through the play, The Vagina Monologues, that Jerry just brought out. And uh, it sort of has become a kind of a consuming um, passion and large part of my life now, <clears throat> along with uh, my mother and with um, loads of volunteers in this country and across the world. We are guided largely by the mission of the playwright of the Vagina Monologues, Eve Ensler, who formulated the global movement, One Billion Rising, and then we sort of uh, have been one of the representatives here in India. Um, you know, one of the things that's been very frustrating for me, um, and I sort of, for lack of a better term, piss a lot of people off when I say this, including activists and feminists, is that I've been only working in this for the last about 12 years or so. And I'm already tired of having to wait for change. And when I say this, people sort of say, but, but we've seen small changes. And, and to me, the small changes are not enough anymore. They're simply not enough. Um, you know, I normally do better with prepared uh, speeches. And I was told not to use too many notes, et cetera. So I'm, I'm going to do the best I can here. Um, I was asked recently to write an article um, for a paper that said, uh, what would you do if you woke up to be a woman one day? And uh, I have that here. And if I have time, I'll read some excerpts from it uh, later. But what that got me to thinking about um, in a very kind of a powerful way was the idea that one of the reasons that we haven't made progress to my liking in this field uh, of, of ending the violence is not just enough to sort of curtail it and reduce the numbers. We have to end this thing. Um, is the fact that I think we look at violence as isolated from the other things that are going on in our society. Uh, and so I, I sort of started this, this notion that we have to start connecting the dots of even things that are seemingly not connected. And I don't know if you remember, but I remember very clearly as a child, um, you know, they used to have those um, books um, where you had the dots. And when you connected the dot, a kind of a picture emerged. And one of the things that I'm sort of working on is that you start connecting these dots and you get this sort of what I'm going to call the tree of patriarchy. And it's this massive, um, all-encompassing, humongous tree with its roots so, so, so deep, um, which is part of the reason why we haven't been able to extricate it. But I think as soon as you start connecting the dots and seeing things for what they are, I think you can start to sort of pull them out from the root and eventually, hopefully, uh, perhaps not in my lifetime, but topple that tree. That's, that's where we are going to end violence against women. It, it's not going to happen any sooner than that. You know, in a poll of about 370 gender experts um, in the world, looking at G20 countries, of which India has become one since the liberalization, so-called, right? India ranks last, last for women, uh, as a country for women to live in. Last. We are lower than Saudi Arabia, which governs its women through a theological aut autocracy, basically, monarchy. We are worse than they are. 
And th that sort of, I, I think we need to start sort of looking at why we are in that position. Despite the fact that, that women are now out educating men in this country, women are outperforming men in a lot of jobs, uh, and yet we've got this kind of this, this constant system of violence that sort of dwells uh, around them and above them and on them. And I last year had spoken a little bit about this war on women. And that war on women, which has been waged by corporations and by the fashion industry and by the media and by religious organizations and, and by education and by um, churches and temples, that war is still ongoing. And, and it is a deliberate war on the bodies of women. You know, I, I, so, so part of what connecting the dots, I'm going to give you a few examples of, of what I mean. Um, you know, since uh, the uh, gang rape and death of Jyoti about two years ago, which was the last time I was, um, around that time I was speaking over here, um, people marched out onto the streets, we lit candles, and there was a bit of a fervor for a few weeks, and then the government kind of dropped a few things to kind of pacify us, and we all went back home. And then a journalist was gang raped in Mumbai. Uh, I think it was about seven months after that, six months after that. And we again lit candles. And I, every time one of these rapes happen, I get a call saying, can you come onto television and can you talk about this? The taxi guy turns to me and he says, Bhai sahab, aapka phone bahut purana hai. And I thought, I, I didn't know whether to be proud, to be... Now, I couldn't get into a long conversation with him uh, because I didn't know where to start. But one of the reasons I kind of carry on my bedraggled phone, it's old, it's ancient, it, many functions don't work, is because I don't know how many of you are aware, but there is a genocide going on in this world right now, in the Congo which has now become the longest conflict in the history of modern humanity. We're into its 13th year. And it has taken over 6 million lives. We have crossed the threshold of the Jewish Holocaust. Right? Not many people know about this. And one of the reasons that Holocaust is happening and that genocide is happening is because the Congo is sitting on four minerals that are desperately needed in all our portable devices, from our Game Boys to our cell phones, uh, to your iPhones, to your, um, those iPods, uh, to X, the, the Xbox, the, you know, all those things. And because they're sitting on this, militia have been sort of created by corporations to remove the um, people from the land so that the minerals can be got to. And one of the strategies they use, and, and, and this is, it, it, I'm sorry if I'm being graphic, but they first go into a village and they kill off all the men. Or they force the men to rape their own mothers, daughters, grandmothers, and then kill them. And then they decimate the women till there are no women left. There are 80-year-old women being gang raped by five 18-year-old boys. There are three-year-old girls being raped by men who weigh a thousand times more than they do. And it's because every one of us in this modern society wants the latest iPhone or the latest Samsung or whatever it is that comes out. And I've deliberately tried to resist that, and not that my resistance is making a darn bit of a difference. But, but because I'm aware of the problem, my conscience doesn't allow me to do that right now. Uh, so, so that's one idea of, of how many of us thought that this, this thing that we're all carrying around is connected to the largest genocide in the history of humanity. And if we don't know it, how do we act on it? So you know when the diamond industry started to sort of get uh, caught for their blood diamonds, 
And if anybody knows anybody at Samsung or Motorola or, or anywhere, I'm suggesting that we start a campaign of conflict-free phones. Phones which do not use minerals from that region. Um, because we've got, to, we've got to play our part in that, otherwise this genocide is gonna be going on next year when I come here, and the year after that, and we're gonna go from six million dead Congolese to eight million and to 12 million, and the only reason that nobody cares is because this is a war that corporations have waged upon a people, and also because it's black people in Africa. And, and we know how well racism is alive, not just in this country, but, but all over the world. Uh, so that's what I mean by connecting the dots. Uh, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, um, violence against women being this, um, this, this thing from, from above, um, but if you start looking at whitening creams as a form of violence against women, if you start looking at diets um, as a form of violence uh, upon the bodies of women, uh, you, you can start to sort of deconstruct the, 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 the fabric that, that kind of upholds those. Uh, and the last thing I'm gonna say since I've sort of run out of my time, uh, and maybe next year if I can come back and I'm invited back, um, this has been kind of my, um, my I don't know what, my, my main mission now, is that in this country in particular, but also around the world, unless we are collectively willing to re-examine the role of organized religion in our public and our private lives, we are going to see no, and I'm, I'm, I'm being very honest, no difference in the rates of violence against women. And I know that that sort of offends a lot of well-meaning religious people, people who are genuinely devout, but enough is enough. Organized religion, I think, is one of the key players in violence against women, particularly in this country. And we've got to uproot that tree from, from below and throw it away. And that doesn't mean throwing away the idea of God or spirituality, but this organized religion has got to go. And that's the only thing that's gonna allow us to see significant change uh, in that and in all sorts of other violence as well. Uh, um, and, and finally, one, one other dot to connect um, is this, this 377 that was repealed by our uh, very esteemed and barbaric Supreme Court. Um, homophobia is the other side of the coin of misogyny. Uh, what we hate in homosexuals is what we perceive as their femininity. And because we hate femininity as a culture, as a society, we therefore then hate homo homosexuals. And so if anybody thinks that 377 is not linked to violence against women, you need to rethink that. It is precisely our violence against women that has allowed 377 to stand for all these centuries. Um, and, and so I'm urging all of you to sort of start connecting these dots because everything eventually sort of connects to what's sustaining that tree uh, of violence against women. So I'm sorry I had to rush through a few things, but maybe in some of my questions I can uh, help answer some of that. So thank you. Thank you, Kaisad. So some very compelling thoughts there. The phones we use lead to murder of children and women. We've been speaking against this, but I still see a lot of people who change phones I would also go to the extent of saying that the food that we eat is also actually conflict-driven in the sense that you have companies like Monsanto giving, um, forcing farmers to use chemicals and pesticides, and you have farmers committing suicides because of that. So, and I could extend that to the clothes we wear as well, um, looking at the condition that workers are working in in the factories and preparing these kind of clothes. So that is also conflict-driven. So where do we draw the? How? how where do I stop? Yeah, um, you know, I think there's, there's a couple of things there. Uh, the, uh, you know, even better examples than Monsanto, uh, which affect women directly, um, are, are uh, beverage companies like Coca-Cola, which have privatized water. And when they privatize water with the cooperation of our government, which sort of sells public water to them, and then people who own that water have to buy water, or what's happening in a lot of cases is that these women have to walk 50 extra kilometers to get the water that they used to get from their, their, their village water supply. That extra 50 kilometers means that she is putting herself at greater risk for violence because she often has to walk alone. She often has to walk either very late at night or very early in the morning, which makes her more susceptible uh, to men waiting in that wilderness to commit violence on her. Um, and so yes, uh, you know, I would say that, that until Coca-Cola and Nestle's, which, which has now openly said that water is not a human right, 
Free water is not a human right. Free potable water is not a human right, according to Nestle's, right? Um, absolutely. The, the only distinction I will make about the Congo situation uh, is that it's, it's a deliberate genocide. It is the deliberate wiping out of an entire people for the interests of about five or six corporations in this, in this world. Um, and so it separates it in terms of its scope. I mean, you know, six million plus Congolese dead, over half a million to a million women raped, brutally gang raped. So the same number of our farmers could be dead if things go like Absolutely, and I, 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 can't, I can't give you a good argument to say, say that. And, and don't forget that when a farmer commits suicide, whether it's a male or a female farmer, but if it is in particularly the male farmers, the woman is left with, with more of the burden, more of the violence that, that society. So yes, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, yes. I couldn't. So uh, th that's exactly the I mean, we are speaking about Congo over here, which is in Africa. So I don't expect Indians who don't know about India to know about it because most people believe Arnab Goswami and think everybody in Odisha is an exilite. And Sharad Pawar is a hero. And you know what I often right. say to people is that, you know, we light candles for these middle class, upwardly mobile urban women, and then we should, and I, I have no issue with that. But how, how many times do we sort of walk out onto the streets and, and light a candle for the Dalit woman who was gang raped, or that woman in Bengal, who because she was having an affair with some guy from the other caste, was, her punishment was to be gang raped in the town square and be watched by the village. I mean, no wonder we're number 20 on the G20 list in terms of you know, the safety and, and, and situation of women. Um, so so I, I, I think that somewhere, and, and again, I think it's, it's, it's uh, the Kap Panchayat situation is directly connected to religion, directly. Uh, again, unless we're willing to sort of take that, and I know nobody wants to take that on, nobody. I mentioned this on um, CNN and IBN one day, and I've stopped being invited there because of that. Because nobody wants to touch religion, nobody. Um, because there are too many vested interests. There's too much power, there's too much money, there's too much property involved in religion. Thank you, Kaisar. Yep. And we'll, we'll, we'll kind of wind up with that because please take more offline questions with Kaisar. But you know, that last thought which you said kind of triggered a. It, it, it disturbs me immensely because you know, everybody thinks corruption is the biggest issue this country has. That's such humbug. Because corruption is never going to get abolished. I promise you that. Because you and I are basically corrupt. We want corruption. We'll stand in line for a McDonald's burger and a Starbucks coffee, but not for our passport and our license. But the biggest problem this country has is the lack of secularism. The biggest problem this country has is communalism. And communalism runs deep in every Indian. We are not Indians here. We are Goans, Punjabis, Marathis. Where is the Indian in India? Show me. And on the only place in the world probably where Killing is honorable and love is dishonorable. That's why honor killings, right? So it's so driven by our entire sentiment of you know, being so patriarchal and the outsider mentality which is so deep. So I mean, and nobody like you write, write this, nobody wants to address that because that's vote bank politics, right? You please the people in Kirki extension, the new parties don't want to do it because who will open this Pandora's box? Everybody talks about rapes which are done by the Ram Singhs of the world. The biggest issue in this country, big numbers of rape are in marital rape. Nobody wants to address that. Can I just say one thing on that? That's an absolutely excellent point. And again, this is something about connecting the dots. People don't know that in this country, you can actually legally rape your wife. The Supreme Court has actually gone out and the legislature has gone out of its way to put into the definition of rape that a husband forcing himself upon his woman, his wife, if they are legally married, is not rape. They have gone out of the way. Most laws specify what something is a crime. They've actually gone out of the way to specify not a crime. And the statistics, these are horrifying, between women aged 15 to 39, and because we still have a lot of child marriage going on, right? The rate of partner rape, which, which is marital rape, right? is at 74 percent. 74 percent of women married between 15 and 39 are being raped by their husbands. Mm -hmm. And this does not say whether it's 10 times or every night or every week. That's just they are being raped. Uh, and that's connected to religion. That's connected to all sorts of economic forces. Uh, again, connect the dots. So thank you very much. So thank you, Kaisar.